they, while there, had a baby girl. She was pregnant on the trip, though she did not live long after birth. They named her Bermuda and buried her there on the island. The survivors of two ships, the patients and the deliverance, constructed uh, or rebuilt those two ships and took all the supplies that they had and got them sa- uh, seaworthy again. And they continued on to Jamestown, where James's wife, Sarah, we don't know which, according to the records, either died shortly before they arrived or shortly after they arrived. So John Rolfe had lost both his wife and a newborn daughter. 1612, Rolfe began planting tobacco from the West Indies as it was considered a more fragrant and sweeter variety than the native Virginia tobacco. It was successful, and the colony sent its first ship to England in 1617. So 10 years... Oh, I'll take that right up here. Thank you very much. Uh, Oh, really? We even got snacks. All right. This is the best gig I've ever had. How about that? So, mm. thank you very much. So 10 years it took before they finally sent a crop for profit to the colony. Well, back after he had arrived, in 1613, 17-year-old Pocahontas had been captured by Jamestown settlers. They were hoping to exchange her for Englishmen who had been captured by the Indians, but the exchange never occurred. I don't know how, except for by the mercy and grace of God, But she came to learn English and actually became interested in their religion of Christianity. You would think of all places, that would be the last thing she'd be attracted to, but it actually did appeal to her. The 28-year-old John Rolfe, well, she kind of caught his eye. And he became a little infatuated with her and actually struck up a relationship, and they began to, um, to talk with one another and begin to fall in love, though there are a couple problems. He greatly desired to marry, but one, he would not, lest it be shown that she was for certain a follower of Jesus Christ, that she was a Christian. That was priority number one because 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, do not be yoked with an unbeliever, and he would not there violate God's word. A lesson for all of us. But secondly, their marriage would be very controversial for one reason. She was of royalty. He's just a commoner. She's the daughter of a chief, a princess by nature. So, therefore, he writes a letter to the governor, Sir Thomas Dale. You can see a reprint of the letter out there on the table, explaining to him the situation and asking for his permission and blessing to marry Pocahontas. Well, Sir Thomas Dale granted them permission, and they were wedded on April 5th, 1614. Uh, Didn't the uh, wedding photographer do a great job? Mm Mm-hmm. The next year, 1616, um, the fall, I'm sorry, the very next year, in January, they would have a son named Thomas, and in the following year, in 1616, they would travel back to England in order to raise awareness and support for continuing the work in the new world. They very much wanted it to be evangelistic. You can see why. Their faith was very important to them and their family, and so they wanted to help get more resources to be able to spread the gospel to the natives of the area. Somebody back in England was very excited to hear of their arrival. His name is John Smith. And when he finds out they're coming, he personally sends a letter to Queen Anne, the wife of King James, telling her of the importance of meeting with them. You've got to meet with them. This is her portrait she had. She changed her name to Rebecca. Uh, She thought that was a more Christian name when they went over there. So he says, you've got to meet with John and Rebecca, all right? They also took some natives with them uh, for people to see and get to know and meet uh, of the Powhatan tribe, okay? So they do, and finally, after 10 years, John's able to make it down to London, and he gets to see Pocahontas once again, and and John as well, John Rolfe 
Uh, again, it had been 10 years since they had seen each other, and it was a great reunion for all of them. Well, they thought the uh, event was a success, and they began to travel a little bit more and then was going to head home, but it wasn't long until, as you can imagine, back in Jamestown that things began to fall apart with John Rolfe gone. In total, of the 6,000 people who settled in Jamestown from 1607 to 1624, only 3,400 would survive, just over half. You literally had a 50-50 chance of surviving in Jamestown. John and uh, Rebecca know they got to get back, and they plan to do so in March of 1617, but Pocahontas gets sick there in England. We don't know if she contracted pneumonia or smallpox or tuberculosis, but at age 21, she passed away. And so now John Rolfe has lost both of his lives. But he does have his son, Thomas. And he eventually does go back and tries to help the colony again. And again, it just kept doing this and this and this and this forever and ever. Now, at the same time that Jamestown was beginning in 1607, back in England, a whole nother set of events are being set in motion. For there, Archbishop Tobias Matthew had begun raiding the homes in Thruby in Nottinghamshire, imprisoning those who had not adhered to the king's church, to the Church of England. A group of separatists, not Puritans, not trying to purify the church, but are so fed up with it, they want to just separate and worship God by themselves worship him according to their understanding of his word. They were led by William Brewster and John Robinson and Richard Clifton, and these separatists began to worship God, not by the dictates of King James, but as they believe, by the dictates of King Jesus. It was illegal, though, for them to not be a part of the Church of England, and so they decided they should leave the country, which was also illegal without permission. But they attempted to do so in 1607, same year that Jamestown is being founded. They were trying to head for Holland, which was a part of the Netherlands there, which is on that coast there. You have France, and then you have Germany, and it's kind of right there on the coast. And so they're planning to head there to f seek religious freedom. They charter a ship, but the captain of that ship betrays them and turns them over to the authorities. And so the men are arrested though they were treated leniently, according to the journal of uh, one of the young men who was part of the Septus. His name was William Bradford. They attempt then to make another try at it in the spring of 1608. This time, they decided, we're going to split up. We're going to try to not draw as much attention, and so we're going to try 60 miles up the coast from where we tried last time. So we don't think they'll be looking for us there. But even then, the women and children are going to journey down the river to the coast, and the men are going to go overland. So we're not as big of a group drawing attention to ourselves. So they were going to board a Dutch ship once they all arrived. The women and children arrive a day earlier, though, than the men get there. They were able to flow down the river just fine, saw no one was there, began to get seasick sitting out there in the harbor. So they said, well, let's go back up the river and just wait up there instead of sitting out here in the open in the harbor, and we'll go back up the river and we'll wait for the men to arrive. Well, the men finally arrive, but there are no women there because when they tried to come back down, the tide had gone out and left their boat stuck in the mud. So... The men, sitting there the next morning, waiting for them to arrive, see the ship and they start, okay, well, let's go ahead and make preparations. We're surely the women and children will be here soon. And some of them start to get on board the ship and get ready to go when all of a sudden, guess who's showing up? The king's authorities to arrest them. So some of them jump off the ship and run to hide. Others are on the ship and the captain pulls anchor and sets out and they're like, what are you doing? Stop, stop, stop. Our, our families are still there. We don't know what's going to happen. Are they going to be arrested? Are they going to be treated? We don't know what's going to happen. Stop, stop, stop. We got to get off. And he's like, I'm not getting caught with you guys. And he started to take off. They freak out. They beg and plead and demand. He turn around and go back for the safety of their families. He's finally convinced to do so. And just as he starts to turn the ship around, lightning, thunder, fierce winds, they cannot turn the ship around. They try desperately 
The storm rages for 14 days. They can't see the star, sun, or moon that entire time. They have no idea where they're at. The captain thought he was being punished by God for not returning the men to their families. However, if that storm had not sprung up precisely when it did, there may never have been an America as you and I know it. When the authorities arrived and found only the women and the children, mostly there, who had finally made it down to the coast, um, they were like, oh, it's women and children we've been sent to apprehend. Okay, um, come here, little boy. Um, hey, uh, you want to put the handcuffs on him? I don't, no, I don't want to put the handcuffs on Well, I mean, we got it. Uh, I, you know, I, the rather awkward situation. They just give them a stern warning, and they all get to go freely. Finally, the men on the ship actually make it to Holland, where they were trying to go. They send word to their families. The women and children, the other men are, are able to get on a ship and make it to them, and they are reunited. They make it to Amsterdam, which eventually becomes the capital, is the capital there of the Netherlands. And from there, a year later, they move to Leiden, which is a little closer to the coast. And from there, William Brewster, along with Thomas Brewer, Edward Winslow and others, they begin working a printing press to send literature back to England to educate people as to what God's Word says, to explain to them the things the Bible says and how some of the things the head of the church known as the king says isn't exactly with what God's Word says. How do you think the king likes this? King James is not too happy with it. So, the king actually will start to send his own, his own agents into the Netherlands to find these guys. It's an international manhunt to find these guys and silence them. So, that's not good. Additionally, after 12 years of residency there, they've noticed their children are speaking Dutch better than they're speaking English. And, okay. And the Dutch culture isn't exactly what they're looking for. It's not bad necessarily, but it's not the most Christian as they were hoping to as a separatist group. And so they're like, wouldn't it be nice if we could just go somewhere where the culture isn't influence our children? Anybody else? So they decide they would be willing to do whatever it took to bring their children up in the ways of the Lord, even if they had to leave the culture, take their children out of the culture. They were willing to do it. And so they acquired a land patent from the Virginia company and financing from, this was the name of the company, the Merchant Adventurers, they provide the financing for, and who in return are going to seek a profit from a colony they're going to start in the New World. So deacons John Carver and Robert Cushman had to go to England and handle the negotiations because William Brewster, whose name has been on all of the literature, has to stay in hiding. He can't go back to England. The company also, though, to make sure things go right, are going to send some of their people, such as Miles Standish, who will be the military leader, and Christopher Martin, who will be the governor of this new colony. They all there in Holland go and purchase a ship. They get on board and set sail on the... No, it's not the Titanic, Mr. Bryson. I'm watching you. What ship did they set sail on? Yes, galley. No! The Speedwell. Very good. Set sail on the Speedwell. They traveled from there, from Holland, up to London, Plymouth Harbor, actually, where they're going to meet up with another ship that has been chartered by other separatists who have been encouraged to go along the trip, and they're going to take two ships then to the New World, the Speedwell and the Galley, the Mayflower, okay? Problem is, the Speedwell develops a bunch of leaks on the way, just from Holland to, to uh, Plymouth there. And so there, some thought the mass was too big, some thought the construction wasn't good, the boards weren't tight, whatever. 
Well, they're in trouble because they've sold their homes to purchase this boat to go. And they're like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Well, the people who were from England, they hadn't sold their homes. They chartered this ship. So they said, you take our ship and cram on there however many people you want, and you all go on the Mayflower for us. And they said, okay. They cram 102 passengers on this boat, okay? 102. And you're like, well, that's okay if it's big enough. Yeah, it wasn't big enough. The 102 passengers are stuck down here. No bathrooms, no showers, no breathing room hardly. The 30 or so uh, crewmen, they are up here in their parts. All your supplies down here to last you. You've got to get there, and then you've got supplies enough to last there until you can start feeding yourself off of the land. And on top of all that, William Brewster insists on bringing the printing press with them. Where are you going to stick that at? Well, he insists. Here's the problem. It was broken. And they said, William. We're, we can't bring the printing press. It doesn't even work. Said, we'll get parts. Where? Where are you going to get parts in the new world? We'll have them shipped over and we'll fix it. He wanted to make sure they could keep sending the literature from the new world. And they're like, D -d -d wait for another ship. The bring He's like, I'm, I'm not going without my printing press. Okay, fine. So somehow they crammed it on there. 49 from the Leiden congregation with 13 apprentices or servants, plus 31 individuals or family members recruited by the merchant adventurers. The separatists, the pilgrims, called them the strangers because they were not of their faith. And then they had six apprentices or servants, and Edward Winslow recorded that two dogs even, an English Mastiff and an English Springer Spaniel, would make the trip as well. And so they had two dogs go with them, and they leave, depart from Plymouth, England, on September 6, 1620 headed for the Hudson River Bay in what is today New York. The trip was challenging, to say the least. Seemed to storm almost the whole trip, so do you get to spend much time up here? No, you're going to be down here the whole time, swaying back and forth with all the winds and oceans. And how do you think it smells after a couple months and nobody showered? And you only have one pair of change of clothes, the ones you're wearing. <laughs> yeah. Bad food, tainted water, again, no facilities. Halfway, the ship is damaged by one of the storms. There's a crack in uh, the, lower, the lower beam. And it was like, oh, what do we do? We're halfway. Do we go on and risk the ship falling apart, or do we turn around and go back, and who knows if we'll ever get another chance to make this trip for the freedom of our families? William Bradford wrote, after they had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, they were encountered many times with crosswinds and met with many fierce storms with which the ship would shroudly shaken and her upper works made very leaky. And one of the main beams in the midships was bowed and cracked, which put them in some fear that the ship could not be able to perform the voyage. So some of the chief of the company, perceiving the mariners to fear the sufficiency of the ship as appeared by their mutterings, they entered into serious consultation with the master and other officers of the ship to consider in time of the danger and rather to return than to cast themselves into a desperate inevitable peril. But in examining of all opinions, the master and others affirmed they knew the ship to be strong and firm under water. And for the buckling of the main beam, there was a great iron screw the passengers brought out of Holland, which would raise the beam into his place, the which being done, the carpenter and master affirmed that with a post put under it set firm the lower deck and other ways bound, he would make it sufficient. Where did they get that giant iron screw? somebody's broken printing press. If they had not brought it along, they may not have been able to secure the ship strong enough for them to make the journey. So they committed themselves to the will of God and resolved to proceed. And just so you know how it continued on, in sundry of these storms, the winds were so fierce and the seas so high as they could not bear a note of sail. 
And in one of them, as they thus lay at hull, in a mighty storm, a lusty young man called John Holland, coming upon some occasion above the gratings, was with a seal of the ship thrown into the sea. But it pleased God that he caught hold of the topsail halyards, which hung overboard, and rain out at length, yet he held his hold, though he was sundry fandoms underwater, holding on to this rope underwater, dragging along, till he was hauled up by the same rope to the brine of the water, and then with a boat hook and other means got into the ship again and his life saved. And though he was something ill with it, yet he lived many years after and became a profitable member in both the church and the commonwealth. In all this voyage, there died but one of the passengers, which was William Button, a youth servant to Samuel Fuller, when they drew near the coast. But to omit other things that I may be brief, after long beating at sea, they fell with that land, which is called Cape Cod. It was sighted on November 9th after two months on this journey. They all ran up on deck and began to praise God for bringing them to the new world. They celebrated so long that Captain Jones finally had to force them below deck. Okay, let me run the ship. I know. You're all singing your praise songs. It's okay. Now, please, please, go down. I got to run the ship. And so they were able to go there. They arrived in Cape Cod, north of where they were to settle, though. They're supposed to be down in the Hudson Bay. They're up at Cape Cod. So they attempt to turn sail and head south. When just out of the south came a blustering wind to push them back north. So they waited a day, and they turned to try to head south again, and a storm raises up and pushes them back again. They turn south again the following day, and the winds blow them up. There is no way they're going south. The winds will not let them. So they floated into Provincetown Harbor of Cape Cod on Saturday, November 11, 1620. This land is not where they're supposed to be going. It's outside of the jurisdiction of the land patent they've been given. So the pilgrims see an opportunity here. They gather together, Captain Jones and his men, the strangers, the people of the merchant adventurers, and their people, and say, when we arrive in this new land, we need to have an agreement as to how we're all going to live together. So let's sit down and have a mutual agreement, a compact by which we will live. And they called it the Mayflower Compact. It provided a social contract between them so that they would all have agreed upon terms of how to live together peacefully. It stated this, in the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be though thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof, we have here under subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the year of thy reign, of our sovereign Lord, King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, and O Domini, 1620. Anybody ever read the Mayflower Compact before? Now you have. That's it. There it all is. Now, here's something that strikes me. My wife, when she was, how old were you? 16 years old. When she and her family were out east, journey to the Mayflower 2, you know, the recreation of the Mayflower. You can go there in, in Massachusetts and get on board there at Cape Cod and, and uh, see what the a recreation of the Mayflower was like. And they give you a little tour and a little history lesson of that. And while there on that history lesson, the tour guide says the pilgrims really didn't come here for religious freedom. They came here to start a new colony and, you know, to, to make a profit to send back to England. In the words of Matt Miles, really? <laughs> Let's go to their own words. 
They have undertaken this journey for what? Glory of God and what? What's the only thing we've talked about this entire time of why they're taking this trip and have gone through all of these risks, if not for the salvation of their family and to be able to worship God according to the dictates of His Word? Well, the next day after this, that was on a Saturday, the next day being Sunday, they've been on board for two months, stuck on this smelly, awful ship. What would you do? <laughs> I'd get off as soon as I could, right? Anybody with me? Yeah, no, it's the Lord's day. So, they spend the entire day on the ship in prayer and worship, having their regular Sunday service. They refused to get off the boat until the following day on Monday. How important was the Lord's Day to them? Pretty important, wasn't it? Finally then, on Monday, November 13th, 1620, the pilgrims set foot in the New World. They explored the land and eventually on December 16th went on to Plymouth Harbor where they settled on a location on December 21st. However, weather kept them from starting home construction until December 23rd. December 23rd, winter in Massachusetts. Great time to start building a house. Yikes. As you can imagine, most of them have to stay where? Back on the boat. Exactly. Exactly. The area had been identified as New Plymouth by a map maker, a cartographer, back in 1614 named John Smith. And they thought that was a good name, so they kept the name of Plymouth to start it, okay? That winter, with the harsh freezing temperatures, disease, and lack of shelter of the 130, give or take, original passengers, only 53 would survive to the following November. Of the 18 wives who had accompanied their husbands, 13 died by the end of March, including William Bradford's wife, who fell overboard into the icy waters one time while he was out on a scouting mission. Isaac Allerton lost his wife and now had his seven and a half and three-year-old to care for by himself. 13-year-old Mary Chilton had both of her parents die, as did 13-year-old Elizabeth Tilly. How would you like to be a 13-year-old clear across the ocean from anyone you've ever known except for the people from church? How important was their church family? 12-year-old Samuel Fuller lost both of his parents. Susanna White was pregnant and gave birth to a son on the Mayflower in November while they were anchored in Cape Cod. Her husband was one who would die that winter, leaving her with her infant and five-year-old sons. She'd be the only surviving widow that would make it through that winter, which I had a feeling her two children were her inspiration to make it through, don't you? She is pictured, oh, I'm sorry, it's out there, but I'll put it up here in a minute. She is pictured in the 1914 famous painting, The First Thanksgiving, by uh, Jeannie Brownscombe, as the one sitting off from the table rocking her infant in praise to God. They remarkably did not give up. They would not go back when the Mayflower left in April of that next year. Ooh, how tempting was it to go back? How tempting was it to go back to Egypt? right? To go back to the culture where everything's comfortable, where we, uh, we, you know, we just, just get along. But they stayed because they believed God had not given up on them. So on March 16th, 1621, a man named Samoset walks into the village. He had learned English from being captured and released by English fishermen in present-day Maine a few years ago. But his friend Squanto had been captured in 1605 and returned home for good in 1619. Squanto actually made six trips across the Atlantic. And his story is rather remarkable. A lot of miraculous things happened in his life as well. 
and uh, he knew English really well. So when Squanto heard of this new group, he went with Samuelset and Chief Massasoit to visit the colony. He was elated to see these people because when he was gone on one of those trips, when he got back and went to see his village to go back home, nobody was there. They had all been wiped out by a plague. And needless to say, none of the native, other natives would dare touch that land. So he went to Massasoit and joined their tribe and was now part of them. He comes in, is ecstatic, asks, can I stay here? Because this is the land of my forefathers. This is the land of my tribe. Can I, can I stay with you? Is it okay? They're like, is it okay? Yeah, because when he walks in and says hello, they're like, hello? <laughs> Do you know any good fishing spots? Do you know where all the best hunting places are? Do you know where there's wild berries? Do you know how to plant corn? Do you know how to do everything it takes to survive here? He's elated. He's welcomed in. He becomes part of the family. He becomes infatuated with their brotherly love for one another, how they pray, how they take care of one another. And he becomes very interested in their religion. Turns out, this group of colonists seeking to just simply live for the Lord and do whatever it took to save their family just happened by chance to settle in the one and only place in the whole northeastern part of this continent that had been vacated by the natives, but had a native still living there who knew the land like the back of his land and spoke fluent English. What are the odds? unless it was divinely appointed. wonder why those winds kept shoving them back north. Colonists became so fond of him that he gets captured by a rival tribe one time while he was out hunting with the other guys. Um, the other guys are killed. He's taken, though, captive because he's a native. And Miles Standish, whose wife also died in that previous winter, he'll lead a group to go rescue him because that's how important he was to them. And once that rescue happens, Squanto negotiates a peace that would last for 50 years between them and the rival tribes. When he gets home, Governor Bradford says, you know, let me tell you about another guy who was taken into by captive, taken captive. And you know what? God worked it out great for him in the long run. His name was Joseph. Let me share his story with you. And Bradford and Squanto became very close friends, and Squanto would choose to follow this God that they serve. And he, too, wanted to become a Christian. The colonists established very good relations with the natives throughout the land because they shared the love of Christ. They worked to evangelize the lost. In return, the natives worked side by side with the pilgrims, giving them extra provisions and showing them some pointers regarding their new surroundings. And after the harvest of 1621, they all got together, most likely in October, to have a, a big harvest feast, a three-day celebration. Ninety Indian warrior men come marching into Plymouth. That means they outnumbered the colonial men three to one. That could have been a little intimidating. But hey, they brought enough venison to last for three days. So they're like, come on in. Absolutely. Let's have a feast. And it was a wonderful celebration. So everything seems to go good. And that's usually where the story ends in all of our history books. Is the great Thanksgiving feast of 1621 with the Native Americans. And, and the story today told as the pilgrims giving thanks to the Indians for having saved them. And that's the end of the story in today's history books. Would you like to, in the words of Paul Harvey, hear the rest of the story real quick? Problems actually came with the arrival of the ship Fortune in November of 1621. 37 settlers arrived, including some separatists from England who hadn't made it on that first trip, including a William Brewster's own son, Jonathan. So there are more of them coming, but... The merchant adventurers, because the Mayflower had gone back and told them everything that happened, they sent new rules and new regulations of how to operate themselves in this new district. 
where they, you know, originally weren't supposed to go, but they're there now. So here's how you're supposed to handle things. The contract of the colony stated that no individual could own their own plot of land for the first seven years. In fact, the plots of land were to be rotated amongst the families every year. So, you plant, till, fertilize, work the ground, who knows, however well, and then the next year you move to the next ground plot of land, and you have no idea how it's been taken care of. They could have done a great job. They could have done a terrible job. And now you may have to start from scratch. And then the next year, do you get to reap the benefits of that? No, you got to move to the next plot of land the following year. So how incentivizing is it to put much effort into your plot of land? Not very much. In fact, it would lead to disaster. Because whatever was harvested from all the tracts of land were brought into the central common store and then distributed evenly amongst all the colonists. Any of this sound familiar? From the very beginning, socialism, referred to by Bradford as communalism, was trying to infiltrate America. It was soon realized that there was not going to be a harvest big enough to support everybody and they were not going to have enough food to last the winter. So Governor Bradford and his council got together and decided, what do we do about this? Because we got to kind of follow the rules, but obviously this isn't working, so we need to do something different. And they all agreed that the answer was in this book. And just as John Smith, 15 years earlier in Jamestown, had gone by scriptural teaching, such as 2 Thessalonians 3.10, that if any would not work, they should not eat. So they, too, chose to do the same thing. Plus, they said 1 Timothy 5.8 was important. That if you do not provide for your own family, you're worse than an infidel. Governor Bradford wrote, And after they began to come into wants, many sold away their clothes and bed coverings. Others, so base were they, became servants to the Indians and would cut them wood and fetch them water for a cap full of corn. Others fell to plain stealing both night and day from the Indians, of which they grievously complained. In the end, they came to that misery that some starved and died with cold and hunger. One in gathering shellfish was so weak as he stuck fast in the mud and was found dead in place. This is how bad it was getting. All this, while no supply was heard of, neither knew they when they might expect any. So they began to think how they might raise as much corn as they could and obtain a better crop than they had done, that they might not still thus languish in misery. At length, after much debate of things, the governor, with the advice of the chiefest among them, gave way that they should set corn, every man for his own particular, and in that regard trust to themselves." In all other things, to go on in the general way as before, and to assign to every family a parcel of land according to the proportion of their number for that end, only for present use, but made no division for inheritance, and ranged all boys and youth under some family. Every family is going to get a tract of land based on the size of your family. That is your responsibility. It's not yours to keep. It's not for inheritance. You don't own it yet, because remember, we can't do that for seven years, but we're not going to do the rotating thing. Here's your seed, go at it. If you have a great harvest and you're taken care of, guess what you can do? You can sell your extra. If you don't have enough, guess what you can do? You can work to get it from somebody else. But we're not going to do this whole, everybody bring it together and divide it up evenly anymore. You get what you get out of your own land, out of your own hard work. And if you don't have a family, we'll assign you one. We'll find a family you can work with and be a part of. Everybody is going to have to pitch in for this to work. How do you think this worked? Think this is a little better? Let's see what Bradford says. This had very good success. For it made all hands very industrious. So as much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been by any means the governor or any other could use, and saved him a great deal of trouble, and gave far better content. 
The women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set corn, which before would allege weakness and inability, whom to have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression. Where are the men? Where are the men? What were they doing all day, every day? Well, you know what guys are doing. <laughs> they were out hunting because you had to have something to eat in the meantime. So who worked the fields? The women and the children. Who beforehand, were they wanting to go out and work the field that they weren't going to get to harvest? No, oh, I'm just too weak. I just can't go do it today. Is it, this is what Bradford said. And he said, if you tried to force them, they would have thought it was a great tyranny. You know, he's like, no, don't, we ain't going there. We're not crossing. Nothing's changed in 400 years, has it? Anyway, <laughs> so the experience that was had in this common course and condition tried sundry years, and that amongst godly and sober men may well evince the vanity of that conceit of Plato's and other ancients, applauded by some of latter times. That the taking away of property and bringing in community into a commonwealth would make them happy and flourishing as if they were wiser than God. Do you hear what Bradford is saying? These great philosophers who think this whole communal system where we all work and we all bring it together and we distribute it evenly, everybody has the fair, equal share, full equity and everything. He's like, has that ever worked in history? That was Bradford's question. Has this ever worked in history? No, it's always disastrous. And he says, as if they think they are wiser than God. Notice what Bradford says about socialism, about communism. Completely contrary to the wisdom of God and his word. That's William Bradford. Wow. This is long before Karl Marx. Before Stalin, Lenin, and all those guys, the wisdom of God, it's as if it is applicable from age to age, isn't it? Amazing. For this community, so far as it was, was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort. For the young men that were most able and fit for labor and service did repine that they should spend their time and strength to work for other men's wives and children without any recompense. The young men who could work, they knew if they didn't, what would still happen? They'd still get fed anyway, so they just goofed off all day and played and, and did nothing. In fact, once they said, if you don't work, you don't eat, they're like, ah, they're just a bunch of Christians. They'll, they'll give us the food anyway. After a few days of not getting anything to eat, they decided maybe I'll work. And they helped contribute, and things flourished. Because the pilgrims believed that if you violated God's word and gave to those who were not willing to work when they were able to work, you were insulting the wisdom of God, and it'd be disastrous for your people. Isn't that fascinating? The strong or man of parts had no more in division and victuals, that's your food supplies, and clothes than he that was weak and not able to do a quarter or the other. This was thought injustice. The aged and graver men to be ranked and equalized in labors and victuals, clothes, etc., with meaner and younger sort, thought it some indignity and disrespect on them. The old men had to do take care of what the young men wouldn't do. And for men's wives to be commanded to do service for other men as dressing their meat, washing their clothes, etc., they deemed it a kind of slavery. Neither could many husbands well brook it. Upon the point, all being to have alike and all to do alike, they thought themselves in the like condition and one as good as another. And so, if it did not cut to those relations that God hath set amongst men, yet it did at least much diminish and the take of the mutual respects that should be presented amongst them and would have been worse if they had been men of another condition. Can you imagine if this wasn't a group of Christians? Let none object. This is men's corruption and nothing to the course itself. I answer... Seeing all men have this corruption in them, God in his wisdom saw another course fitter for them. And thus we did that and we prospered. From these extremities, the Lord in his goodness kept these his people and in their great wants preserved both their lives and healths. Let his name have the praise. 
And to that we say, amen. From then on, the colony flourishes. They will establish new settlements. They'll become the starting point, the training center for people coming over from the, new, from the old world to teach them how to survive in the new world. And all the while, they remained absolutely steadfast upon the word of God. It was then in 1623, everything's looking great, when from the third week of May to the middle of July, no rain. Anybody been there? <laughs> Corn began to wither. The colony came together and said, well, there's only one thing we can do. Pray. So they had a whole day of fasting and prayer. Bradford wrote, wasn't a cloud in the sky, not a hint of rain on the horizon. But it seems to me in reading it, if he had one, he brought an umbrella with him. That night, after their full day of fasting and prayer, here's what Bradford wrote, and you can read a reprint of it out there. It began to overcast, and shortly after, to rain, with such sweet and gentle showers as gave them cause of rejoicing and blessing God. It came without either wind or thunder or any violence, because what would have happened? It would have blown it down or it flooded it out. But it was that perfect soaking rain, he says, um, as that the earth was thoroughly wet and soaked therewith, which did so apparently revive and quicken the decayed corn and other fruits as was wonderful to see and made the Indians astonished to behold. It was like overnight, poof, their corn was perfect again. And afterwards, the Lord sent them such seasonable showers with interchange of fair, warm weather as through his blessing caused a fruitful and liberal harvest to their no small comfort and rejoicing, for which mercy and time convenient, they also set apart a day of, there it is. How many of you hear this part of the story every year in November? And that is how this nation was founded. Upon God's word, full faith and dependence on Him, giving Him all the praise and honor, including a special day of thanksgiving unto God. Even Susanna White with her infant and five-year-old. And if it had not been, in my estimation, divinely sent storms in England and in America, at just the right times, these things may have never happened. And we then would not have the tremendous bounty of the richest, freest nation to ever exist for which we could all enjoy to such an extent and do so with a day of thanksgiving ourselves. So monumental is this history, and this is the conclusion, that they are enshrined in the rotunda of the United States Capitol. From 1819 to 1855, eight large paintings were commissioned to be painted and hung in the rotunda, amongst many other little smaller reliefs and statues and paintings, to commemorate the foundational events of the American nation. The eight most important, noteworthy, for the largest paintings in the rotunda of our United States Capitol that are still hanging there to this very day. What eight moments did they choose? The presentation of the Declaration of Independence, the landing of Columbus, because that started everything, the discovery of the Mississippi, <laughs> I find that one interesting, the victory at Saratoga, because that's then when the French came and joined us, the victory at Yorktown, when we won over the British. General George Washington's resignation of his commission, we're going to talk all about that tomorrow night. And the last two, two of the most foundational moments in establishing our nation, the conversion of Pocahontas to Christianity and the embarkation of the pilgrims for religious freedom in the New World. So of the eight large paintings in the Capitol's Rotunda commemorating the eight most important moments 
leading to the establishment of the American nation. Two are the conversion to Christianity and the seeking of religious freedom. So look at what we've learned tonight regarding our American founding. We've seen the absolute devotion to God and His Word, the pursuit of religious freedom, the adherence to Christian principles and morals, the rejection of socialism and the overwhelming success of capitalism, and divine intervention in the establishment of this new nation. Now, i got to say this because of the world in which we live today. It is not un-American to voice one's opinion and speak out for whatever you desire or pursue in political change. That is the American way, to have the freedom of speech and the freedom to have dissenting speech. And we should all be champions of protecting that, even if we don't like what's being said, okay? Or we don't agree with the thoughts that are being said. But we also need to understand, though, that what someone may be advocating, that can be un-American. So anything that is opposite of the values of religious freedom, capitalism and hard work, and principles, morals, particularly Christian ones, anything opposite of that, by definition, is not American, according to our foundation. That being said, we often pray for revival in America, right? We hear that all the time, to turn back to God and to our godly roots, our American heritage, our biblical foundation. And that's fine, that's great, that's wonderful, but understand, from our history we've seen, revival never starts in the state house. Doesn't start in the White House, doesn't start in the courthouse. I would maintain it is even very hard for it to even start in the church house. I suggest to you it will never start until the fathers and the houses of Christian homes stand up and say, we're going to live by the traditional American values, which gets what? Our biblical values. And they stand up and say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to teach the next generation that hard work is virtue. That solemn devotion to God and the Lord's day and His Word are paramount. And Christian morals are never to be compromised. They are values that cherish Christ and serving Him above all other. And that's what we're going to do in our homes. I mean, what were the pilgrims willing to do for the salvation of their homes? So the next generation would know these things. You know, sadly in our culture today, it's the exact opposite. Self-interest, self-pleasure, it's cherished above all. My inconvenience is not tolerable. A soccer game or a sports practice on Sunday triumphs the Lord's Day. Meeting around together as the Lord's people to remember what the Lord has done for us. I mean, tell you, we, we've loved the, and this is not just, you know, commercial selling. We, we love these books as, as kids uh, for our family because of uh, the Tuttle Twins. Um, this one tells them about, um, they, they teach all these lessons, and it's great, but they don't, have, they don't use any Bible, so they can be used in any public forum, yet guess what they're teaching, you know? And um, like the messed up market, when the government tries to get in and do its incentives and uh, does its... Um, uh, you know, these little things that it tries to do to help and turns out doesn't help, you know, and all those types of things. Or this one, uh, the creature from Jekyll Island. This is about the Federal Reserve. Ask my kids what happens when they print more money. What happens to the value of it? They know. They can tell you because it was, it was a fun exploration in this book and what's important. Or this one. This one's, oh, my. Uh, search for Atlas. This is about why some people get paid more money than others, and it's not wrong. But at the same time teaches that you shouldn't do bad things if you're getting paid more than others. You should do good things with it. You get paid for what you do, for what you work, and for what you earn. What did Paul say? A laborer is worth his wages? Do you know? This isn't hard to do. 
In reality, it's just hard to make the decision to not be part of this culture that is standing against this. So, we ask the question tonight, will there be revival in the land? Well, you have to answer the question yourself. Will there be revival in my home, in my life, whether you have kids or not? Am I ready to have God revive a new work in me? Because believe me, every single one of you are absolutely vital to it. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we all are needed, that we all have a place. We saw that in the example of the pilgrims tonight, how there were families that they, there were people, old and young alike, they would not have survived if it wasn't for the church being there. Every person is absolutely vital in your kingdom. Forgive us when we think we're not important, that we don't have a job to do, that there's nothing for me, you know, I can just retire from, Lord, Wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, whatever type of employment, whatever phase in life, wherever we're at, help us to realize tonight there's a way to be a light in this world. There's a way for us to be encouragement to the body of Christ. There's a way to share the gospel through just loving people and serving people. And there is absolutely a way to commit our families to you. So may we be ready to take a step of faith and just trust where you may lead and we be willing to do whatever it takes with great humility, but with great passion and love and care so that Jesus and how he cares for people might be seen through us. That is our prayer and our commitment and our joy that we find in our Creator and Savior, Jesus. And it's in His name we pray. And those who are willing to commit to Him said, I'm enjoying this a lot. It, it's uh, really interesting to see how God has blessed faithful people. And it doesn't mean that he made it easy for them, but it's certainly a blessing. Um, and speaking of blessings, uh, Ryan is here, and he said just whatever the offering is. Um, there isn't a set amount. There isn't just whatever you can give. And so we're going to ask you guys, you know, think about what you can give, whether you can give tonight or not. I don't think we're going to pass the plate tonight. We have two plates in the back there. Um, think about it for a minute, what, what you can give. And, and uh, uh, as Calvin always says, don't, don't give till it hurts. Give till it feels good. So uh, I, I'm, I'm really thankful for Ryan, and I'm thankful for, for his, his presentations. I encourage you to be here Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. Um, I'm, I'm especially anxious for tomorrow night because I love George Washington, my favorite president, bar none. And uh, so I encourage you guys to come and, and learn, about, learn about what he has to say about that. Also, I'd encourage you um, to look at some of the books out there. Uh, the, Barton is the author of a lot of those guys. He is, from what I understand, he is the foremost Christian historian there is in American history. So uh, I encourage you to look at those books, and uh, let's, let's close with prayer, and I'll let you go. Father in heaven, again, I thank you for Ryan. I thank you for, for all that he has brought to our attention. I also thank you for our country, and I thank you for the ways that you've blessed us, and you bless so many people for being faithful. Lord, I pray that you by this example that you, you show us how we can be that faithful, how we can trust you even when things look bleak, that your name might be glorified in all that we do. So we ask that you bless this evening and uh, bless us as we go home.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming.